Anapanasati Pali, Sanskrit Anapanasmrta, meaning, mindfulness of breathing. Sati means mindfulness. Anapana refers to inhalation and exhalation, is a form of Buddhist meditation originally taught by Gautama Buddha in several suttas including the Anapanasati Sutta, MN 118. Anapanasati is now common to Tibetan, Zen, Tiantai and Theravada Buddhism as well as Western-based mindfulness programs. Simply defined, Anapanasati is to feel the sensations caused by the movements of the breath in the body as is practiced in the context of mindfulness meditation. Topic. Origins in Buddhism Anapanasati is a core meditation practice in Theravada, Tiantai and Chan traditions of Buddhism as well as a part of many mindfulness programs. In both ancient and modern times, Anapanasati by itself is likely the most widely used Buddhist method for contemplating bodily phenomena. The Anapanasati Sutta specifically concerns mindfulness of inhalation and exhalation, as a part of paying attention to one's body in quietude, and recommends the practice of Anapanasati meditation as a means of cultivating the seven factors of enlightenment sati, mindfulness, dhamma vikaya, analysis, varia persistence, which leads to pity rapture, then to pasity serenity, which in turn leads to samadhi concentration, and then to upekka equanimity. Finally, the Buddha taught that, with these factors developed in this progression, the practice of anapanasati would lead to release Pali, vimutti, Sanskrit moksa from dukkha suffering, in which one realizes nibbana. Topic. The practice Topic. Traditional sources A traditional method given by the Buddha in the Anapanasati Sutta is to go into the forest and sit beneath a tree and then to simply watch the breath, if the breath is long, to notice that the breath is long, if the breath is short, to notice that the breath is short, while inhaling and exhaling, the meditator practices training the mind to be sensitive to one or more of the entire body, rapture, pleasure, the mind itself, and mental processes, Training the mind to be focused on one or more of inconstancy, dispassion, cessation, and relinquishment. Steadying, satisfying, or releasing the mind, a popular non canonical method used today, loosely based on the Visuddhimagga, follows four stages repeatedly counting exhalations in cycles of ten, repeatedly counting inhalations in cycles of ten. Focusing on the breath without counting Focusing only on the spot where the breath enters and leaves the nostrils i.e., the nostril and upper lip area. Vasubandhu's Abhidharmaka Sakarika also teaches the counting of breaths to ten as does the Dhyana Sutras translated into Chinese by An Shigao. This is organized into a teaching called the Six Aspects or the Six Means which according to Florin Deleanu, the practice starts with counting, ganana, which consists in counting breathing from 1 to 10. When this is accomplished without any counting failure, dosha, the practitioner advances to the second step, i.e., pursuing, anagama, which means intently following the inhalation as it enters the body and moves from the throat, through the heart, the navel, the kidneys, the thighs to the toes and then the reverse movement of the exhalation until it leaves the body. Next comes concentration, stapana, which denotes focusing one's attention on some part of the body from the tip of the nose to the big toe. In the fourth step, called observation, Upalaksana, the practitioner discerns that the air breathed in and out as well as form rupa, mind sata, and mental functions kata ultimately consists of the four great elements. He thus analyzes all the five aggregates. Next follows the turning away vivarda, which consists of changing the object of observation from the air breathed in and out to 
the wholesome roots of purity and ultimately to the highest mundane dharma. The last step is called purification and it marks entering the stage of realization of the way, which in Abhidharma literature denotes the stage of the stream entry sotapana, that will inevitably lead the adept to nirvana in no more than seven lives. Topic Anapanasati Sutta Anapanasati is described in detail in the Anapanasati Sutta, breathing in long, he discerns, I am breathing in long, or breathing out long, he discerns, I am breathing out long, or breathing in short, he discerns, I am breathing in short, or breathing out short, he discerns, I am breathing out short, he trains himself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body, he trains himself, I will breathe out sensitive to the entire body, he trains trains himself, I will breathe in calming bodily fabrication, he trains himself, I will breathe out calming bodily fabrication, if it is pursued and well developed, it is said to bring great benefit, this is how mindfulness of in and out breathing is developed and pursued so as to be of great fruit, of great benefit, as for the training, the Anapanasati Sutta states, on whatever occasion the monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world, on that occasion his mindfulness is steady and without lapse. When his mindfulness is steady and without lapse, then mindfulness as a factor for awakening becomes aroused. He develops it, and for him it goes to the culmination of its development. <laughs> Modern sources First, for the practice to be successful, one should dedicate the practice, and set out the goal of the meditation session. One may decide to either practice anapanasati while seated or while walking, or to alternate seated and walking meditation. Then one may concentrate on the breath going through one's nose, the pressure in the nostrils on each inhalation, and the feeling of the breath moving along the upper lip on each exhalation. Other times practitioners are advised to attend to the breath at the tondon, a point slightly below the navel and beneath the surface of the body. Practitioners may choose to count each inhalation, one, two, three, and so on, up to ten, and then begin from one again. Alternatively people sometimes count the exhalation, one, two, three on both the inhalation and exhalation. If the count is lost then one should start again from the beginning. The type of practice recommended in the three pillars of Zen is for one to count. One, two, three. On the inhalation for a while, then to eventually switch to counting on the exhalation, then eventually, once one has more consistent success in keeping track of the count, to begin to pay attention to the breath without counting. There are practitioners who count the breath all their lives as well. Beginning students are often advised to keep a brief daily practice of around 10 or 15 minutes a day. Also, a teacher or guide of some sort is often considered to be essential in Buddhist practice, as well as the Sangha, or community of Buddhists, for support. When one becomes distracted from the breath, which happens to both beginning and adept practitioners, either by a thought or something else, then one simply returns their attention back to the breath. Philippe Golden has said that important learning occurs at the moment when practitioners turn their attention back to the object of focus, the breath. Topic. Active breathing, passive breathing Anapanasati is most commonly practiced with attention centered on the breath, without any effort to change the breathing. In the throat singing prevalent amongst the Buddhist monks of Tibet and Mongolia the long and slow outbreath during chanting is the core of the practice. The sound of the chant also serves to focus the mind in one pointed concentration samadhi, while the sense of self dissolves as awareness becomes absorbed into a realm of pure sound. In some Japanese Zen meditation, the emphasis is upon maintaining strength in the abdominal area. 
Dantian or Tondon, and slow deep breathing during the long outbreath, again to assist the attainment of a mental state of one pointed concentration. There is also a bamboo method, during which time one inhales and exhales in punctuated bits, as if running one's hand along the stalk of a bamboo tree. Alan Watts noted something more in watching the breath with regards to Zen Buddhism. Active or voluntary breathing, I will breath in, etc., is clearly something the person is doing. Passive breathing, involuntary daily breathing, is something we imagine as being done, but not by us. It is something that just happens. In a watching the breath type of meditation, we might experience both types. But suddenly it can dawn upon us that we are doing both. The involuntary breathing also seems to be something we are doing because we experience being everything. We are doing everything. And it can flip, both are just happening. The voluntary breathing also seems to be something that just happens, again because we are being everything. But now, everything is just happening. Thus we may see our very decisions to do things as just happening, just spontaneously arising, he asks. Do you decide to decide? Be careful to note that Alan Watts points out that both things are true, we decide and have free will, and we don't decisions just happen. This is the Zen perspective where we embrace this paradox. We might say that this or any paradox exists only as a human thought and in this case, we cannot understand think how these opposites can exist together, yet in reality, that is not burdened by thought, this is our experience. Thus watching the breath is one way to experience these things. Pranayama, or yogic breath control, is very popular in traditional and modern forms of yoga. Topic. Scientifically demonstrated benefits The practice of focusing one's attention changes the brain in ways to improve that ability over time. The brain grows in response to meditation. Meditation can be thought of as mental training, similar to learning to ride a bike or play a piano. Meditators experienced in focused attention meditation Anapanasati as a type of focused attention meditation showed a decrease in habitual responding a 20-minute Stroop test, which, as suggested by Richard Davidson and colleagues, may illustrate a lessening of emotionally reactive and automatic responding behavior. It has been scientifically demonstrated that Anapanasati slows down the natural aging process of the brain. Topic. Stages Formally, there are 16 stages, or contemplations, of Anapanasati. These are divided into four tetrads i.e., sets or groups of four. The first four steps involve focusing the mind on breathing, which is the body conditioner Pali, Kaya Sankara. The second tetrad involves focusing on the feelings vedana, which are the mind conditioner pali, sita sankara. The third tetrad involves focusing on the mind itself pali, sita, and the fourth on mental qualities pali, dhamma. Compare right mindfulness and satipatthana. Any Anapanasati meditation session should progress through the stages in order, beginning at the first, whether the practitioner has performed all stages in a previous session or not. Topic. In the Theravada tradition According to several teachers in Theravada Buddhism, Anapanasati alone will lead to the removal of all one's defilements and eventually to enlightenment. According to Roger Bischoff, the Ven. Webu Sayada said of Anapanasati, This is a shortcut to Nibbana, anyone can use it. It stands up to investigation and is in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha as conserved in the scriptures. It is the straight path to Nibbana. 
Anapanasati can also be practiced with other traditional meditation subjects including the four frames of reference and metta bhavana, as is done in modern Theravadan Buddhism. In the Chinese tradition In the 2nd century, the Buddhist monk and Shigao came from northwest India to China and became one of the first translators of Buddhist scriptures into Chinese. He translated a version of the Anapanasmrta Sutra between 148 and 170 CE. This version is a significantly longer text than what appears in the Ekatara Agama, and is entitled, The Great Anapanasmrta Sutra. Ch. Daan Bansho Yi Jing Taisho Tripitaka 602. At a later date, Buddhasinga, more commonly known as Photoding, Futu Sheung 231 to 349 CE, came from Central Asia to China in 310 and propagated Buddhism widely. He is said to have demonstrated many spiritual powers and was able to convert the warlords in this region of China over to Buddhism. He is well known for teaching methods of meditation, and especially Anapanasmrta. Photoding widely taught Anapanasmrta through methods of counting breaths, so as to temper to the breathing, simultaneously focusing the mind into a state of peaceful meditative concentration. By teaching meditation methods as well as doctrine, Photoding popularized Buddhism quickly. According to Nan Weijin, Besides all its theoretical accounts of emptiness and existence, Buddhism also offered methods for genuine realization of spiritual powers and meditative concentration that could be relied upon. This is the reason that Buddhism began to develop so vigorously in China with Photoding. As more monks such as Kumarajiva, Dharmanandi, Gautama Samgadeva, and Buddhabhadra came to the East, translations of meditation texts did as well, which often taught various methods of Anapanasmrta that were being used in India. These became integrated in various Buddhist traditions, as well as into non-Buddhist traditions such as Taoism. In the 6th century, the Tiantai school was formed, teaching the one vehicle SKT. Ekayana, the vehicle of attaining Buddhahood, as the main principle, and three forms of Samatha Vipassana correlated with the meditative perspectives of emptiness, provisional existence, and the mean, as the method of cultivating realization. The Tiantai school places emphasis on Anapanasmrta in accordance with the principles of Samatha and Vipassana. In China, the Tiantai understanding of meditation has had the reputation of being the most systematic and comprehensive of all. The founder of the Tiantai school, Zi, wrote many commentaries and treatises on meditation. Of these texts, Zi's concise Samatha Vipassana, his Mahasamatha Vipassana, and his Six Subtle Dharma Gates are the most widely read in China. Zi classifies breathing into four main categories panting, unhurried breathing, deep and quiet breathing. And stillness or rest. Zi holds that the first three kinds of breathing are incorrect, while the fourth is correct, and that the breathing should reach stillness and rest. Venerable Suan Hua, who taught Chan and Pure Land Buddhism, also taught that the external breathing reaches a state of stillness in correct meditation. A practitioner with sufficient skill does not breathe externally. That external breathing has stopped, but the internal breathing functions. With internal breathing there is no exhalation through the nose or mouth, but all pores on the body are breathing. A person who is breathing internally appears to be dead, but actually he has not died. He does not breathe externally, but the internal breathing has come alive. Topic. In the Indo-Tibetan tradition 
In the Tibetan Buddhist lineage, Anapanasmrta is done to calm the mind in order to prepare one for various other practices. Two of the most important Mahayana philosophers, Asanga and Vasubandhu, in the Sravakapum chapter of the Yoga Karabhumi Sastra and the Abhidharma Kosa, respectively, make it clear that they consider Anapanasmrta a profound practice leading to Vipassana in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha in the Sutra Pitika. However, as scholar Leah Zoller has demonstrated, the practice traditions related to Vasubandhu's or Asanga's presentations of breath meditation were probably not transmitted to Tibet. Asanga correlates the 16 stages of Anapanasmrta with the four Smrtiapasthanas in the same way that the Anapanasmrta Sutra does, but because he does not make this explicit the point was lost on later Tibetan commentators. As a result, the largest Tibetan lineage, the Gelug, came to view Anapanasmrta as a mere preparatory practice useful for settling the mind but nothing more. Zoller writes, the practice tradition suggested by the treasury itself and also by Asanga's grounds of hearers is one in which mindfulness of breathing becomes a basis for inductive reasoning on such topics as the five aggregates. As a result of such inductive reasoning, the meditator progresses through the hearer paths of preparation, seeing, and meditation. It seems at least possible that both Vasubandhu and Asanga presented their respective versions of such a method, analogous to but different from modern Theravada insight meditation, and that Gelakpa scholars were unable to reconstruct it in the absence of a practice tradition because of the great difference between this type of inductive meditative reasoning based on observation and the types of meditative reasoning using consequences, thal, gyur, prasanga, or syllogisms, sbyo. R ba prayoga with which Gelakpas were familiar. Thus, although Gelakpa scholars give detailed interpretations of the systems of breath meditation set forth in Vasubandhu's and Asanga's texts, they may not fully account for the higher stages of breath meditation set forth in those texts. It appears that neither the Gelakpa textbook writers nor modern scholars such as Lati Rinpoche and Jendan Lodro were in a position to conclude that the first moment of the fifth stage of Vasubandhu's system of breath meditation coincides with the attainment of special insight and that, therefore, the first four stages must be a method for cultivating special insight. Zoller continues, It appears, that a meditative tradition consisting of analysis based on observation—inductive reasoning within meditation— was not transmitted to Tibet. What Gelakpa writers call analytical meditation is syllogistic reasoning within meditation. Thus, Jamyang Shapa fails to recognize the possibility of an analytical meditation based on observation, even when he cites passages on breath meditation from Vasubandhu's Treasury of Manifest Knowledge and, especially, Asanga's grounds of hearers that appear to describe it. Stephen Batchelor, who for years was monk in the Gelakpa lineage, experienced this firsthand. He writes, such systematic practice of mindfulness was not preserved in the Tibetan traditions. The Gelugpa lamas know about such methods and can point to long descriptions of mindfulness in their Abhidharma works, but the living application of the practice has largely been lost, only in Dzog Chen, with the idea of awareness rig pa, do we find something similar, for many Tibetans the very term mindfulness sati in Pali, rendered in Tibetan by Dran Pa has come to be understood almost exclusively as memory or recollection. As Batchelor noted, however, in other traditions, particularly the Kagyu and Nyingma, mindfulness based on Anapanasmrta practice is considered to be quite profound means of calming the mind to prepare it for the higher practices of Dzogchen and Mahamudra. For the Kagyupa, in the context of Mahamudra, Anapanasmrta is thought to be the ideal way for the meditator to transition into taking the mind itself as the object of meditation and generating vipassana on that basis. The prominent contemporary Kagyu, Nyingma master Chogyam Trungpa, echoing the Kagyu Mahamudra view, wrote, Your breathing is the closest you can come to a picture of your mind. 
It is the portrait of your mind in some sense, the traditional recommendation in the lineage of meditators that developed in the Kagyu Nyingma tradition is based on the idea of mixing mind and breath. Quote, the Gelakpa allow that it is possible to take the mind itself as the object of meditation, however, Zoller reports, the Gelakpa discourage it with what seems to be thinly disguised sectarian polemics against the Nyingma Great Completeness and Kagyu Great Seal meditations. In the Panyakrama Tantric tradition ascribed to the Vajrayana Nagarjuna, Anapanasmrta counting breaths is said to be sufficient to provoke an experience of vipassana, although it occurs in the context of formal tantric practice of the completion stage in highest yoga tantra. <laughs> 